I'm Jerry Gertz of CurlingZone.com, joined by Director of Event Operations, Curling Canada, Warren Hansen. Welcome, Warren. Thanks, Jerry. So uh, we've, we've seen some uh, media, a lot of play, some changes to the Scotties and Briar system this year with uh, uh, relegation. The official term is uh, the pre-qualifying event, but I think uh, a lot of the uh, people who are detractors of the system have kind of run with the word relegation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly something that's not uh, r normal in uh, North American sports. And, and I think it's taken fans some time to, to, or it will take some time for them to adjust to it, the shock factor of teams not participating. But it's very common in, in places like uh, Europe and, and sports like that as well. Well, sure. I think it's it's uh, common with the World Curling Federation because as we sit today, the World Curling Federation is almost 50 countries, yet there's only 12 that play in the World Championship, and certainly most of those countries are concentrated into Europe, and of course, they come out of the European Championships, which is, I think, now three-tiered, yeah, if, if I'm not yeah. wrong, of uh, three levels of, of play-in. So it's it's not uncommon. I, I guess it's, it's uh, difficult here because there's not... 20 teams in the play or 10, there's uh, four. And uh, it is a system that has been adopted this time to, to be used to allow all 14 provinces and territories to be part of what we're doing. And uh, certainly some may agree, some may disagree, but uh, it's what we're using at the moment. Yeah, some of the, you know, the thought process is, you know, why do we need to involve uh, all the member associations? Why does North, uh, Northern Ontario deserve an entry in the women's side, for example? Um, you know, it's the Canadian Curling Association, Curling Canada now, after the rebrand, uh, uh, is made up of a bunch of member associations, and, and that's really the decision makers in this process at the end of the day, is it not? Without question. We have 14, what we refer to as MAs, member associations, and those 14 member associations are the owners of the Canadian Curling Association. So when the annual meeting takes place every year, which will be this year in June, uh, certainly we have those 14 members, each with two delegates, along with the Canadian Curling Association Board of 10, and uh, those are the people who vote uh, to make any major decisions that are done in the sport of curling in Canada, whether it's a change, something new, whatever the case may be, that's where the process takes place. So rules and, and all that stuff as well exactly. that comes into play. Yes, anything to, do, anything to do with rule changes or anything of a magnitude, anything to do with change of structure of any of our events or anything of that nature uh, has to be passed through the uh, annual general meeting. So, you know, it seems like uh, for a lot of fans, I think they're just realizing that this is going on now, but it's has been a long process to get to this point as well. It's been a very long process. I think the discussions probably started four, even five years ago, and I think it really started to happen with the territory of none of it becoming a more active part of what's taking place with the rest of Canada and as a result the the issue came up of how they would be part of our system. Certainly the, pro the territories of Yukon Northwest Territories have faced similar uh, challenges over time and I guess if we look back in history there was a time when the Yukon played off with British Columbia and the Northwest Territories played off with Alberta. That was changed in 1975 and since 75 the Yukon and Northwest Territories have come in under the joint uh, entry of the territories, which of course that served the purpose, but still it was becoming very difficult as well because the cost of travel between Yukon and uh, uh, Northwest Territories, Whitehorse and Yellowknife, had become very, very expensive and it was costing them outrageous amounts of money to fly teams between the two territories and as a result they were even going into a process uh, with some of their events where one year the Yukon would go and with the other year Northwest Territories would go. So that was another thing that was uh, being brought forward as a, as a problem. Well, I, I can certainly attest to seeing that problem happen last year as well in the in the Briar Playdowns, where the event was hosted in in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories, and the Yukon did not send right. any entries across. Yes. You know, you're looking at. I, I, we had interviewed Bob Smallwood about this earlier, and he talked about the costs of of travel being in anywhere from five thousand to ten thousand dollars just to go for your playdowns. Exactly. And if you bring no, but into the same equation because basically their air, air avenue is through Ottawa. Uh, quickly figure out what would be involved with, with that taking place. So this really began, I think, to become a, an issue of major discussion maybe five years ago, and it grew and grew and grew and was discussed and discussed and discussed. And finally, the current system that we put in place now, I think, was agreed on three years ago with the implementation in 2015. And so it didn't just happen. It was it was long ground discussed. Practically every option or possible consideration that you could come up with 
were part of those discussions, and in the end, uh, the 14 member associations and the CCA board voted on the current system. Um, my, my memory tells me that it was a fairly large majority that voted in favor, but I do know that there were a couple of provinces or territories that did not vote in favor. My memory isn't that good right now, but uh, it wasn't 100% unanimous. Yeah, getting unanimous consent on any decision is always difficult yes. anyways, and there's always going to be unhappy people with the processes. Yep. And, and, and the whole relegation discussion, the, you know, there's a lot of pressures being placed on Curling Canada, uh, both on the ice and from the fans, the curling, the tradition of the game, against the pressures, the competitive pressures of elite sport. Uh, a lot of your funding comes from uh, uh, through performance, winning medals at world championships and Olympics is critical to that funding. You know, how critical is that, to be honest? Well, I'm not the person who is directly uh, dealing with the high performance end of it, but uh, certainly without question, uh, the majority of the funding that the Canadian Curling Association receives from Sport Canada, Canadian Olympic Committee, Own the Podium, uh, goes towards the development and training of our high performance athletes. And uh, we're in the mix there with I don't know, maybe 50 other sports that are all competing for the same money and certainly one of the main gauges of what curling might get versus cycling is uh, based on international performance. So international performance is extremely important, whether it be world championships or Olympics. And, you know, we did have some great success at the Olympics and, and uh, with uh, the double gold medals in, in, in curling. And But you go back and look at the process there, the way we get those teams is a best teams at the uh, at the championship and long-term success to get there whereas when you look at at the Briar and the Scotties we've had some hiccups at the international level with the teams that, that have won there you know yeah. it's it's so that these competitive pressures really do come into play do they not yeah without question I mean in, in recent times our teams internationally have done pretty well but certainly if we go back in history, there have been, well, there was a seven-year period of time between 1973 and 1980. The curse that, of the that, the curse, that uh, we never won a world championship. And uh, a couple of those times, we didn't even get into the final. So, you know, there's been a lot of things done by Curling Canada and then CCA over the years to try to enhance um, the performance of our teams internationally to, for them to be able to do the best they can. And I think that's helped a lot in ensuring somewhat consistency, but uh, it's still, it's a difficult place to go into. I've been there, done that. I know the feeling when you're going to represent Canada, who's expected to win, and you're playing against uh, now 11 other countries who look at us in a little different light than anybody else, and you can be assured that when they play Canada, they will play their best. And if you're not at your best, they're probably going to beat you. And to a point now, these teams are becoming professionals. Exactly. The Scots yep. are, they are professionals, they curl for a living, yep. you get that with uh, several other countries as well now. Yeah, Scotland, Norway, Sweden in particular, who all produce very good teams, their curlers are pretty much full-time players, they're, they're no longer uh, amateurs like they were years ago, and it's the Olympics that has certainly done that because the funds to do that is coming from the Olympic committees in all those countries. There's been, you know, there's been a lot of ideas floated out there about uh, ways to you know, other ways to execute on changes to the briar, things like pools, um, going to five sheets, and, and uh, teams can, you know, some teams will play three draws a day kind of thing. Um, when you guys sat down and had these discussions with the member associations, you know, how did the discussion roll around these different options? And, and, and what are the factors that, you know, led away from something like pools or five sheets or yeah. stuff like that as well? Well, we discussed it all, and I think in each and every case, went through with the pros, the cons. Four sheets of ice is an interesting one to discuss because I think there's few people know why we have four sheets of ice and there's probably about three reasons why that has become kind of the standard that, that we use. So when we first started doing this, I think there was probably about three considerations that evolved from it. One was the fact that television was becoming far more of a factor in what we were doing and we needed more people out there from their end of it. Uh, we're dealing with an event like the Briar with uh, numerous still photographers that we have to try and accommodate as well. And so the whole activity area out there with just the two walkways and uh, no place in many cases for people to go was becoming an issue. And so we looked at the whole thing and said, well, this is one we can, we can deal with. It. The other thing I think that was becoming an issue, and again, we've got to remember that these big events are always their spectator events where we have to cater to our customers. And we've got to try to make sure that we provide them with the best possible environment we had. And we, we through time, 
had a lot of complaints that if you were sitting down on the outside area, not too far from ice level, the outside sheets of ice were being blocked from a lot of your view because it's simply the way they're too close to the boards. Yeah. So by going to the four sheets, we'd eliminate any kind of complaint of that nature at all. I think another consideration that, again, was through discussion and feeling people out, for the novice person, watching four sheets of ice is a much easier thing to do than five. And five is far more confusing than four, strange as that may seem, but we who are familiar with the game can easily follow all five and can wonder why one sheet less can make a big difference, yeah, but, a, it, but, a, it, but it does. There is a can't come up the word right now, but it's a lot more even. You got a sheet with a certain amount of space, a sheet with a certain amount of space. Yeah. The five sheet design, it's two paired, two paired, and, and one separate. So there can be some confusions in that point as well, I would presume. Yeah, I mean, and you can go back right to the building right here right now. It's got Olympic size ice surface. You could put six sheets of ice in here. Yeah. And we did that once, but we only did it once in 1991, because again, that had lots of repercussions from, from doing that. And again, it's just, it becomes overwhelming with, with the six sheets of ice. So I guess, again, we have to try and service all worlds. We're trying to serve what's best for the athletes, what's best for the media, television. But probably first and foremost, we gotta keep the fans very happy because if we ha haven't got them, we're done. Yeah, exactly. Certainly a component of that. Pools is probably another option that was discussed, taking pools the teams. Discussed. At great length. And, and I think, again, the pool situation, because of, again, this 87-year-old event has been based on a round robin where everybody plays everybody, probably is a real um, hesitancy to take a step beyond that, not knowing for sure what the result is that going to be from, a, again, a fan acceptance point of view. How is it going to work really from a television end of things versus what we've done in the past? I think the other thing that came into those discussions is seating because in pools um, that always becomes a, a, a challenge or an issue as to how you're going to seed those two pools. Yeah. So I think all those things were part of the discussions and again I don't think anybody was really willing as a, as a mass anyway to move into a, a territory where we would split the such a drastic change to the overall change. event that will affect everything through the duration. And, and maybe at some point in time, maybe that will happen. I don't know. But at this stage of the game, it wasn't felt to be the thing to do just at this point in time. With the response to, to pre-qualifying and all that, yeah. maybe some people will soften to the idea of pools a little bit. And as, as I, a I don't know. Well. I, I mean, I'm sure this is going to be discussed again and again here over the next few years. I'm not sure... We asked, I think, at one point that this, once we put this in place, that's given three years to kind of air out and, and uh, see what does happen, because it's very tough to make a, a decision or evaluation or something after one year unless it's really gotten sour on you. But I'm sure it's going to be brought up again this year, and I'm sure there's going to be people that'll want to see it change for 2016. So if people have feedback, it's the member associations it's they the should be talking to, and ideally with some constructive ideas at the same time. Yes, I mean, because I've... Uh, I've had people say to me, you know, this is ridiculous, this doesn't work. I've said, my response is, okay, what would you do? Yeah, exactly. And, and taking the following things into consideration, they kind of get, well, there must be a better way. Well, okay, <laughs> what is it? Yeah, I had this circular discussion with somebody at one point, too, where we went from, you know, why don't we try this, you do pools, well, here's the issues with this, well, why don't you go to uh, uh, five sheets, well, then some teams are going to have to play three a day, yeah. and, and you're going to go to a two, a three, a two, a three. These teams are not going to be able to hang out in the patch and be part of that fan experience. And now, Which again, something else has to be remembered with what we've done. Four divides evenly into 12. Yeah. And so that allows us to very easily balance everything. Yeah. It is such a perfect schedule for everything that wraps around the briar. Which I should have mentioned earlier, that was the other reason why we went to four sheets, because four does divide evenly into 12, yeah. five does not. And so it evens everything out. Yeah, so you'll see teams, they'll have, uh, they'll have the night off, and then they'll have yep. the next morning off, and you'll yep. see them out at the patch. Yep. You know that fan experience is important, I think, as well. That I think it it would it could dynamically change the whole patch player fan. It it, it could. I mean, it's not to say again that it's going to be etched in stone forever. But I mean, at this stage of our lives, I think it's what everybody agrees is is the best approach for us to be taking at this time. So, some would say, you know, that we're starting to uh, you know to eat away at kind of the 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 spirit of curling and but you know we need to look at the game it, it's it needs to evolve over the long term and I think this week it's something you look at the attendance figures from this week compared to uh, uh, compared to last time I was here five years ago we're at half the number on the opening weekend yeah. so far and and 
we can't sit here. A lot, you know, a lot of the comments I get from players or, or from fans, sorry, that uh, you know things like if it's not broke, don't fix it. Well, I don't know if that's the case. If we're, you know, we have half the audience here, and how do we, you know how? Where does the association go? What kind of things are being done to try and try and evolve this? And you know, it's all part of the relegation story and, and all this yeah. stuff as well. Well, I think there's been a lot of discussion in the last couple of years. I think there's going to be a lot more discussion in the next couple of years ahead with regard to what do we need to do going forward with these few very good teams and players and everybody else. Yeah. Uh, do we continue to try and mix them all together? Or is there a point where possibly there has to be some kind of a separation made? There's differing opinions on it, uh, within our own ranks even as to what should happen or, or what might, might be done. And I think it's it's going to be a continued discussion. I'm not sure at what point in time you may see anything change from what it is now, but I'm a firm believer that at some point there is going to have to be a change because what mixed and worked right for the last 87 years has now got some question marks attached to it. And I think you mentioned the attendance here, and uh, I think all live event businesses are, are facing the same kind of challenges right now. Unless yeah, this you're, isn't unique to curling. No. It's hockey, baseball, yeah. all the sports are unless facing. Unless you're, you know, in the NHL in Canada and even some HL Canada teams are not doing all that great, or the NFL in the U.S., um, everybody else is going right now, okay, what do we have to do to get people into our venues? Television numbers for us are very good, continue to be, and that's certainly a strength of what we've always had, and it yeah. continues to be a strength, but the venue situation and getting people into it is, is going to be a challenge going ahead that we're trying to meet, but still know it's going to be difficult. Yeah, you can almost, you can almost see it's an opportunity at the same time, too. You get, you get uh, St. John's and Sault Ste. Marie competing now to host a briar. Yeah. So, you know, they, it's the opportunity to, you know, rot to, to bring their, their fans together and, and generate some excitement well ahead of the event. And, and sell pre-ticket packages and, and all that stuff. I just saw that recently, and that's kind of a, a cool uh, little you know change to wait. Yeah, I mean, there's some areas out there they've indicated they have an interest, and they're, they're smaller centers, and uh, I guess it'd be much like the situation in Canada last year. We said, okay, uh, we'll consider, consider going here, but here's a number that yeah. you've got to come up with up front before they even be, can begin to make any sense. And so we've got a couple more communities that have decided that they're going to take a run at that. So yeah. that's, that's, as we move forward, that's probably good because I'm... I know we've had some great runs in these big buildings, um, but uh, based on where things are going and even the response so far here this week, I'm, I'm wondering myself if, in fact, the big building events are maybe going to be out of our touch in the future or maybe not as often as we have been. Maybe it's going to be maybe a, a one in eight thing versus now it's probably a, a one in four or one in three. Well, the big building thing is kind of, you know, you've been through the whole thing. You know, you've spearheaded and, and built this to what this is now with uh, the help of a lot of great people. What uh, you know? What kind of challenge did you face to get it here? And 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 uh, you know, what are some lessons that we could probably learn from where we've been to where we are now? Well, I think the big buildings are—they've uh, always been a challenge because they're costly, yeah. and particularly if we're removing an NHL team as we are here in Calgary for uh, virtually a two-week period in the middle of their season. Um, the cities and the teams cooperate, certainly want our events because our events bring good economic impact to the area as well as it gives good visibility for the city across Canada for a two week period or a 10, 10 12 day period. But still very costly for us to come into a big building because we've got to come in here and we've got to negotiate um, every single thing that we're doing with them. Uh, whereas we go in a smaller venue, we may have an all encompassing one deal. Yeah. But here it's, it's complicated, it's, it's complex, and, and it's costly. Yeah. And so before we even start in a major event, we've got a fairly significant financial nut to meet just to, to cover our cost of operation. And then the other thing into these bigger markets, to sell the event, to advertise it, and to sell it to the public where we're going, again, is far more costly in Calgary, example, than it is in Kamloops or St. Yeah. John's, Newfoundland. So you roll that into, a, into the ball and it becomes a much bigger financial challenge to do these big events than a smaller one. And so we, we hold our breath. Are we you know, going to get enough people that are going to come forward to, to make ends meet? And certainly over the last 10, 15 years, we've had some very successful events in these big buildings. But again, that's changed. That's an evolution. That's and I don't think it's anything that specifically is a fault of curling. I think it's just kind of our demographic has traditionally been 45 plus. 
And the people who have been supporting us for the last 20 years are getting older, and it's much easier for men to stay at home, watch on television, versus come to the venues. Crack their own original 16 at home exactly. and, uh, and uh, enjoy, enjoy exactly. their home experience. Yeah. Yep. Some new initiatives are being worked on. Uh, Chris Dornan, uh, I think the term underground marketing has kind of come on board to, uh, to kind of bring a new fan experience to the event. Uh, saw some great uh, uh, coverage uh, this week with... Uh, with the Absolute Dance Crew opening up uh, some of the uh, curling. There's some stuff going on at the patch that's uh, new and trying to target the younger generations. And, you know, it's it's something I know that you've really driven and tried to promote and bring and try and bring new ideas in. It's always a risk, right? Yep. You know, you get, uh, you know, it's hard to break down those doors sometimes. Very hard. It's, it's because, again, we're dealing with this vastly varied demographic. And I go back to last week in Moose Jaw of, personally receiving complaints about what are you playing that rap music for, <laughs> right? That's awful. Yeah. And at the same time, you're watching the reaction from a lot of the crowd and you're watching the teams are saying, yeah, this is, this is cool, we like it. And it's, it's creating an electricity in the building, an atmosphere, which is what we're trying to create. There's certainly some debate going on about Saturday night uh, with uh, Cotter in the hack to throw his last rock and the yeah. crowd is chanting his name, Cotter, Cotter. Yep. It looked like a fun experience, but the you know a lot of the fan re response to that is negative. Yeah, so it's so a, it's hard to understand. It's a thin whether, line. Yeah. I mean, we went through through some similar things in Edmonton two years ago, and Stoughton uh, and, and uh, Martin. Yeah, right. And I mean, it's the same thing again. It's we're trying to create an atmosphere where we're going to attract people. But when they start to have fun and going a little too far this way, everybody says, whoa, is that what we want to have happen? Yeah. So it's, it's something we're going to have to work with. But I, I guess I look at it from a player point of view. I haven't been a player myself. I think if the players can become, they can become accustomed to anything if it's a regular routine. I mean, look at pro sports. Look at basketball. Yeah. Free, free throws. Um, so if it's a regular experience for them, they will become accustomed to it. Yeah. It's just we have to make sure it doesn't become one-off once a year it happens. Yeah, I think I think it's a good experience, especially with the Olympics and the and the, yeah, with the, Olympics, the crowds that you get. Certainly there. in Vancouver was difficult for, for non Canadian teams. And it was the same kind of crowd. It was a whole bunch of people who had applied for Olympic tickets and ended up getting curling. I was there all week and yeah. you know what? It was the greatest crowd, the greatest yeah. experience, the excitement, your heart is racing, it's yeah. It's sport. So that was a lot of the same atmosphere that was existing here on Saturday night. Yeah. There was a lot of younger people having a good time and probably never been to a curling game before in their life and didn't even realize that this probably really isn't an acceptable thing to do in curling, right? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Warren, Director of Event Operations, Curling Canada. Appreciate your time. It's been great uh, to uh, sit down and talk to you and, and hear a bit more about uh, relegation and, and, and the process and everything that went in behind it. Uh, thanks. This is Jerry Gertz of Curling Zone. For more great coverage of the 2015 Tim Hortons Briar, be sure to check out curlingzone.com. Everything curling.